Heads up, because you're in the Hoodwood. I'm the Black Bandit, KJ Green, welcoming you to Sports from the Hoodwood, August 24th, 2019. Coming up this week, did Jay-Z sell Cap out? And will we have real influence with the NFL? Is Melo being blackballed by the NBA? Is 300 wins in baseball now an unachievable total? We'll look at our final week of NFL previews, go out west. While the final word on kneeling has it served its purpose. That gap head slap and as many sports takes is allowed by law in less than an hour. I check with the legal department. It's the truth. It's all coming up at you. Sports from the Hoodwood. Are you ready? Let's go. You're tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood. The internet's foremost location for the most honest, unfiltered commentary and insight on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's Hoodwood's hometown hero, K.J. Green. Green from Hoodwood, when the football season is almost upon us, you can smell the woods and feel the intensity bearing down on you like Lawrence Taylor used to do on unspecting quarterbacks. I'm your man, K.J. Green. Welcome to this another edition of Sports from Hoodwood for the next to last weekend of August 2019 and... The kids are now back in school. We don't have any of the little minions running around causing havoc. They're all in bed now because it's tonight's a school night. Well, anyway, when you're listening to it, it'll be Friday, so you really don't have to worry about it. Let's start out this week with a serious topic. After all the silliness I've led off with, Jay-Z's Rock Nation and the NFL have come to a partnership to develop entertainment for the Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, and Sean Carter, known to his many millions of devoted fans as Jay-Z, has more or less inked the deal with uh, Rock Nation, and he's going to try to parlay this deal into partial ownership of, the, of an NFL team. Rumor has it, it could be the Pittsburgh Steelers. Can he do it? I'm not betting against him. But the larger question remains. There's two questions that are here that are before the uh, jury, if you, if it will, of popular opinion. First of all, will he have any kind of real influence if he's an owner? Or will he be just part of a dog and pony show? You have those that think that Jay-Z, who has basically, in all of the people who despise him and call him a thug, yes, I'm talking to you, Tommy Laren, they call him a thug and a criminal and what have you. He is what many people who would be in conservative thinking be the, if you didn't know his name and didn't know his rise to fame who would hear his story as the classic Horatio Alger story someone who brought himself up from abject poverty from the Marcy uh, Brooklyn homes the projects in Brooklyn brought himself from a hard scrabble life and was once a drug dealer but got out of the life got out of that and basically built himself up first as a underground rapper, then as a more established mainstream voice, still in the rap game, still as a very hardcore rapper to someone who has more or less brought himself up to being a media mogul with savvy business deals with a savvy eye for talent someone who has basically built himself up from nothing to being one of the richest self-made millionaires on the planet now jay-z is close to 50 he'll be 50 in november Rappers don't have a long shelf life, if you will. They You don't see rappers busting out gold noldies nowadays, even though you might see Hammer every now and then 
playing the, uh, the local Chitlin circuit, but I digress. Jay-Z has more or less taken himself and made himself into a very, very rich man. With that kind of money and stature come the spoils of wealth. You don't see black men owning sports teams. Michael Jordan is a notable exception, but in the quote-unquote old boys club of sports ownership, you don't see black men, period. Other than Michael Jordan, name me a black sports owner. I'll wait. You know that there's none. And in the NFL, which is basically a license to print money if you're in that 32-member boys club, rich white boys, I should say, let me correct that, rich white old white men club, you have a license to print money. For someone like Jay-Z, coming from the tough as nails streets of Brooklyn, to even have a chance to be in the owner's box for a team is something that many people never thought would happen. Now, you also have the question of one, Colin Kaepernick, who still does not have an NFL job. And I've heard the detractors say, oh, he wants $20 million. He wants this. He wants that. By and large, Colin Kaepernick has been blackballed from the NFL. Let's just call a spade a spade. Colin Kaepernick will probably never play another game in the NFL. That being said, Jay-Z, who had taken a strong anti-NFL stance, now comes out and says, we're past kneeling. Now, I will get into that a little bit more in depth in my final word. But the question remains, the second question I wanted to pose is, did Jay-Z throw Kaepernick under the bus? Did he sell him out? Basically, someone with as much financial influence as Jay-Z has, as much as a tastemaker as Jay-Z wields as tastemaker influence, the pull that he would have as someone who could develop real dialogue and change in social justice partnering with the NFL has been strangely silent. And many players called Jay-Z out, most notably Eric Reed, who knelt right alongside Colin Kaepernick when he started his protest a few years back. Jay-Z said that we're past kneeling. And then you have knuckleheads like Freddie Gibbs saying, pardon my French, fuck Colin, as he's jocking Jay-Z. Now, I'm thinking this guy, Freddie Gibbs, must want a record deal from Jay-Z or something. Because, honestly, and I'll ask the question, who the fuck is, who in the little fuck is Freddie Gibbs? I had to look up his Wikipedia entry to find out who this guy is. And I'm still thinking, why should anyone care what this guy's opinion is on sports? Who cares about your son? You're taking a say. Shut up. Who cares about my sports take? There are people who do care about my sports take. I am a writer. I've written about sports. I am an observer of sports. This guy, Freddie Gibbs, is a quote unquote, and I use the term, quotes air quotes very loosely a musician he is somebody i think is chasing the spotlight he is somebody that i think is trying to get his name out there trying to get trying to get his name in the news cycle, someone who is trying to 
basically get under or get noticed by Jay-Z and someone who's trying to get a larger record deal with maybe Rockefeller maybe but his straight diss of Colin Kaepernick is sounds more like a jock than anything but I digress back to my original point the NFL now has its perfect dividing point now there are half that are saying you side with Jay-Z, you don't side with Cap. And this clown, Freddie Gibbs, just sounds right, just like the House Oregon. There are those who say that if you side with Cap, you can't be down with Jay-Z's actions. All the while, Roger Goodell sits on the sideline, grinning and laughing. He has his dividing point now. Divide and conquer, and he'll still make his money. When there was a united front, people behind Colin Kaepernick and people who were behind the anti-kneeling stance. That was troubling. That was a big problem for Roger Goodell. But now he has someone like a Jay-Z that he can say, well, he's on my side. Now the divisions are clear. Now it's an, instead of all of us against all of them, it's two sides fighting with one another while the NFL sits back and collects the checks. Sure, Jay-Z may have some financial influence here and there, but until someone like Jay-Z has a seat in the owner's box, a seat at the owner's meetings tables, the social justice causes that Kaepernick has knelt for and has ultimately been blackballed by the NFL by, will continue to get unheard and more or less swept under the rug. It's a sad situation indeed. We will take our first time out, come back and talk about Carmelo Anthony. Has he been blackballed from the NBA? Sports for the Hood continues after this. You're tuned into Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's foremost location for no-nonsense commentary, insight, and opinions on the world of sports. Here now live in living color, black by popular demand, your host, K.J. Green. Right from the studios of Black Dead Productions and Enterprises, you are in the Hoodwood. My name is K.J. Green, and with basketball still a couple months away, and I gave you last week some of the games to watch. One of the things that to this day still puzzles me is with all movement of player acquisition, why Carmelo Anthony still is going without a job. Now, Carmelo Anthony has been in the league as long as LeBron James has. Now, Dwayne Wade, who was one of his also heralded Draft mates retired just at the end of uh, this past year. But Carmelo Anthony, who is at 35, still looks like he has a fairly viable game. He is, except for his small time in Houston and his one year in in uh, Oklahoma City, where he more or less was coming off the bench or as a valuable six man, playing has done no fewer than scoring, averaging 24 points a game. And the thing that I don't understand about the mentality of coaches, GMs, that seemingly almost are afraid of bringing Carmelo Anthony in to play. Now, granted, the seven years he played in New York, his games kind of regressed into an iso ball black hole you know chunk up a shot it with with five or six seconds left in shot clock make or miss sometimes he makes it sometimes he throws up bricks but the thing that I've never understood is Carmelo Anthony has very rarely ever been a locker room problem 
more or less soldiering on, getting his shots, getting his game in. You would think someone who was a quote-unquote locker room problem would not have been selected to four Olympic games. You would think someone who might have been a bit of a problem would have not been on three gold medal winning teams. Someone like Carmelo Anthony, who, if he was a problem, would have not been the U.S.'s all-time leading scorer in Olympic history, all-time leading rebounder, all-time leader in service, in games played. Not LeBron, not Kobe, Carmelo Anthony. And it puzzles me that after eight years in Denver, seven years in New York, and then brief cups of coffee in Oklahoma City and Houston, you're telling me that there isn't a team that could use someone like Carmelo Anthony as a sixth man. Bring him off the bench for some instant scoring punch. I think Carmelo Anthony, at his basketball advanced age of 35, could fill in a really nice hole. You're telling me the Lakers couldn't use Carmelo Anthony? Why isn't LeBron James spoke up for his banana boat brother? It's a question that's puzzling me. You're telling me that Jared Dudley, Jared Dudley for crying out loud, you're telling me that Jared Dudley has more of a value to a team than Carmelo Anthony would. You're telling me that Oklahoma City wouldn't kill to have someone like Carmelo Anthony, a proven scorer, taking dimes from Chris Paul. You're telling me that there are, are at least a half a dozen teams that could use, that couldn't use, I should say, there aren't a half a dozen teams that couldn't use Carmelo Anthony who scored is averaging, whose career average is 24 points a game. Carmelo Anthony is a 25,000-point NBA score. And you can count on how many, on just a certain number of fingers, how many players have as many, if not more, than Carmelo Anthony in points right now. According to the list I'm looking at here from basketballreference.com, Carmelo Anthony is in 19th place all time in the NBA score. There is no one above him active with more points scored with the exception of LeBron James. Dirk Nowitzki just called it a career at 31,560. But if you look above him, the names that are above him, uh, Alex English, Kevin Garnett, John Havlicek, Paul Pierce, Tim Duncan, Dominique Wilkins, Oscar Robertson, Hakeem Olajuwon, Elvin Hayes, Moses Malone, Shaq O'Neal. I mean, like I said, those are Hall of Famers, no doubt. But then you're looking at some of these clowns that are still playing, still on rosters. You're telling me that someone who has scored 25,551, this is not a 551 Films production, but I like the number 551, but I digress. You're telling me someone that has scored 25,551 points cannot get a job. You're telling me that someone who has averaged 24 points in their career and aside last two seasons in Oklahoma City and Houston never was below 20.8 points in, in a season and that 20.8 points was in his second season you're telling me someone with that kind of scoring punch can't get a job cannot find work in the NBA you're telling me that Vince Carter who is coming back for his umpteen numbered season is able to get a job and play for Atlanta. And again, I'm not knocking Vince Carter. I think he's a good player. 
for crying out loud, Vince Carter is ancient. Vince Carter will be 43 when the NBA season, the 2019-20 season ends. Full of people to have played in the NBA for decades. But you're telling me that Vince Carter, who has an average over 10 points in his career in five years, can get and keep an NBA job. But Carmelo Anthony, who has never averaged less than double figures at any point in his NBA career, can him be looking for work. That makes no sense. What did Carmelo Anthony do to other teams to make them not want him? That makes no sense. You're honestly telling me someone like Danny Green, Jared Dudley, who I've already, I've already blasted before, can have jobs. But Carmelo Anthony sits and waits. That makes no sense. I could find at least five teams. Oklahoma City, the LA Lakers, Charlotte, Atlanta, Washington, heck, even the New York Knicks for crying out loud. All could use someone like Carmelo Anthony, a proven scorer. But still he goes waiting. Someone make it make sense. I'm taking another time out, come back and explore 300 wins. Is that in Major League Baseball a now unachievable stat? Sports from the Hoodwood continues after this. You're tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's premier location for no nonsense commentary, insight, and opinion on the world of sports. Here now, the man with 100% certified fresh change, your host, KJ Green. One for the money, yes sir, two for the show. A and couple of years ago, the on Headland and the Low, was the starter, and something and good. With me and my nigga wrote the mod. I was looking over some numbers, just trying to find I'm that bit of a number to keep myself. I'm always looking at numbers, I said. Look at some money in your pocket. Head out. Seems like I always got somebody heckling me nowadays. But anyway, looking at numbers, looking at pitching totals, Zach Grinke became the 115th pitcher to break the 200-win plateau. He is now tied with players like the immortal Chuck Finley, Tim Wakefield, and only a couple behind legends like Sheriff Roy Halladay. May he rest, late just the uh, Hall of Famer, uh, Bob Lemon, Don Drysdale, or just within his sights. Um, he might, he probably won't get that this year, but he's pretty close to getting them uh, within the next couple, within the next year or so. Zach Greinke is 35. If, excuse me. It may be a very, very, very big stretch for him to get another 100 wins in, say, the next five years. Pitching until he's 40, five straight 20-win seasons, not likely. The last pitcher to make the 300-win plateau was Randy Johnson. That was 10 years ago. Now, there was a stretch of time between... 1985 and 2009 where one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pitchers jumped in the 300 win club. Let's keep going back further. There was a stretch. It was a 27 year stretch between 1982 and 2009 where the members of the 300 win club almost doubled. I mean, the first pitcher to, to eclipse 300 wins was Pud Galvin in September of 1888. And you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 
pitchers after that in the next 50 years. Then you didn't have another player, you didn't have another pitcher reach 300 wins for 20 years after. Lefty Grove hit 300 wins in July of 1941. Then you didn't have another pitcher hit the 300 mark until Warren Spahn did it in 1961. And then Early Wynn did it two years later. Both Lefty Grove and Early Wynn's last wins were their 300th win. After that, you didn't have another player get to the 300 win plateau to Gaylord Perry in 1982. Then you seem to have a lot of the great pitchers. You had six pitchers in seven years. Steve Carlton, Tom Seaver, Phil Necro, Don Sutton, Nolan Ryan all did it between 1982 and 1990. And all of, all of the pitchers that I've mentioned are all in the Hall of Fame. The next one to hit the 300 win plateau was Roger Clemens. Now, he will have the Peds cloud hanging over him for a while. Then after that, only Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, and Randy Johnson hit the 300 win plateau. Think about this. A pitcher who pitches 15 years has to win 20 games every year to get to 300. That's not going to happen. With the rise and proliferation of middle relievers, pitchers not going more than five or six innings because of pitch count, you don't have the kind of longevity dominance, endurance that pitchers like say in my generation, Randy Johnson Greg Maddox or Tom Glavin had Randy Johnson pitched 21 years as did Tom Glavin Greg Maddox pitched 22 years Roger Clemens pitched 23 years. Nolan Ryan pitched 27 seasons to get 324 wins. All of these pitchers that are on the 300 win list pitched 20 years or more. The only exception being Tim Keefe in the 19th century. He pitched 13 years and won 342 games. But that was way back when pitchers would pitch 40. 50 games a year. I would just happen to look up one Kid Nichols, who won 362 games between 1890 and 1906. This guy won 27 games one year. He had a 10 consecutive season with 20 wins or more. If a pitcher wins 20 games in a single year once, he's high considered for the, for the Cy Young Award. Kid Nichols won 35 games one year. You'll never see the last pitcher to win 30 games in a season was all over 50 years ago. Denny McClain won 31 games in 1968 in the year of the pitcher. You'll never see a pitcher win that many games. I remember when Bob Welch won 27 games for the 1990 Oakland A's. That was almost 30 years ago. You don't see the, the, the uh, a pitcher winning 20 games plus, and it's a rare sight. To do it multiple times is something that is becoming a dying breed. A pitcher now, it's been 10 years since a pitcher has approached 200, uh, pardon, it's been 10 years since a pitcher approached 300 wins. Randy Johnson being the last one, there isn't even a a pitcher, an active pitcher with 250 wins. I stand corrected. There's one pitcher that is active that has 250 wins. That's CC Sabathia. He's calling it a career at the end of this year. The next one down, Bartolo Colon, hasn't won a game this year, and I don't think he'll do. I don't think he's going to win any games. He's pitched 22 seasons. Justin Verlander's at 219. Justin Verlander's also 20, is also 36. 
Now, what's the odds on him winning 80 games in the next, I don't know, five to six years? Slim to none. After that, you got Zach Greinke. After that, you don't have anybody with 200 wins. You don't have anybody with 200 wins, much less 300 wins. Can a pitcher be the type of endurance? Uh, uh, let's try it again. Can a pitcher have the kind of endurance, longevity, and not only to be to only have those factors, but to also have the kind of pitching skill to win games on a consistent basis? You're talking about winning a game. You're talking about winning multiple games. You're talking about winning multiple games over multiple seasons in high numbers. You're not going to see that. The the era of 300 win see uh 300 win the era of 300 win pitchers I think is closed. There are 25 pitchers in the 300 win club. And I don't think there's going to be anybody getting anywhere near it. Not in my lifetime, I don't think. Considering that CC Sabathia, who is my age, oh no, CC Sabathia is a few years younger than I am. I don't know what I'm talking about. But you have someone like CC Sabathia who is pushing 40. You're not going to see anyone get close to 250 wins much less 300 and 200 wins is starting to become the new norm, the new standard for overall pitching excellence in a career. I think 300 is a dying breed. We will take another time out, come back with the West previews in the NFL, NFC West, AFC West, as we close the book on my predictions and previews. As we are getting ready to move to Thursdays, where the show will come out on Thursdays, just in time for the NFL uh, start of the uh, NFL week every week. The show will be moving, so I'll be taping it on Wednesdays, and you'll be able to hear it on wherever you, uh, wherever we pick up your podcast on Thursdays. But I'll go back over that programming note a little bit later in the in the show. Sports from the Hood will continues after this. Foremost location for the most honest, unfiltered commentary and insight on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's Hoodwood's hometown hero, KJ Green. And on we go in the Hoodwood. My name is KJ Green. Welcome back. And we'll take a look at the NFL preseason predictions. Uh, we've covered every direction. North, east, south, and now we head west. We'll start out with the AFC in my predicted order of finish. First place, I have the Kansas City Chiefs, finished 12-4 last year. Now, Kansas City Chiefs came in overtime coin toss away from making their first Super Bowl in 50 years. With Patrick Mahomes at the helm and an absolutely embarrassment of riches on both sides of the the ball and offense and defense. Andy Reid looks like his team could really be ready to take that next step. And you're thinking they better because they may be running out of time to keep that defense together. Though Patrick Mahomes is coming into his own, asking him to throw 50 touchdown passes again may be asking a bit much, even though I took him in my fantasy draft and just hope he does somewhere in that neighborhood. Second place, I got the L.A. Chargers. Though my father, may he rest, is probably still looking down at that ultra-high skybox with my brother going, L.A., what in tarnation is all of this? Still trying to get used to the Chargers being in L.A., even though they've been there three years. The Chargers are good. Very good. They have a rugged defense, a solid running game, and the wily veteran, Phillip Rivers. Anthony Lynn is making the most after a very slow start to his career. 
They've went 22 and 8 after they started out 0 and 4. This is a team that is sneaky good. And the and the growing rivalry between the Chiefs and the Chargers, they had some epic battles in the last four meetings. This is must-see football, and these two teams have gone a, a strong dislike for one another. But I still think the Chiefs have just enough to hold off the Chargers to stay ahead in the AFC West. Third place, I have the Oakland Raiders. Yeah, they finished 4-12 and last year, but I can't count out a Chucky Gruden coach team. Though I don't like Gruden, I think he's a little bit bombastic. No, check that. I think he's a lot bombastic. The Raiders are headed to Las Vegas next year. So this is kind of a weird lame duck season for them in the East Bay. Nevertheless, I still think Derek Carr is a solid quarterback who still has a lot to prove. They still have question marks on offense and I mean, on defense and in their running game, but I think they make enough improvement to get out of the AFC West basement. So who's in the AFC West basement? The Denver Broncos, who, coming off their first back-to-back losing seasons in 47 years, when I read that, my eyebrows went up. The Broncos have not had back-to-back losing seasons since 71 and 72. That being said, the Broncos have a lot to improve on. Yes, they acquired Joe Flacco, but their offense still has a lot left to be desired. And that defense, oh, brother. Yeah, they only gave up 349 points last year, but it just seemed like at the end tail of the season, they just fell apart. Big Fangio, the new Broncos head coach, has a lot to work with. Are a lot to improve. Yeah, he came over from the Bears and made that Bears defense fearsome, but he has a lot fewer tools to work with in the AFC West. Reiterating my predictions for the AFC West again for this year, I have Chiefs, Chargers, Raiders, and Broncos. Turning now to the NFC West, who do you think I'm going to pick first place in the NFC West? Of course, the LA Rams. They finished 13 and 3 last year, scored 527 points, and were just fearsome in their division. They bullied everybody and they steamrolled their way to a division title. Can they keep it up? I don't see why not. Both Sean McVay and Jared Goff are both young and enthusiastic. That running game behind Ty Gurley, if he can come back to full health, this is going to be a very, very dangerous offense. And that defense, whoop. Boy, figure out how to stop Aaron Donald. And when you can do that, get back to me with notes. Because very few teams were able to slow down Aaron Donald, much less stop him. This is the Rams division to lose. And second, I have the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, I know, I know. They scored, They went 4-12 and last year. But that was without Jimmy G, who looked painfully rusty in his first game back. But I think he can knock off the surface rust, and I think that this team has the pieces in place to make a strong run. The defense is good, the offense is improving quickly, and if Jimmy G can put it all together, this could be the surprise team in the NFC. In third place, I have the Seattle Seahawks. They finished 10-6 and six last year, but I just don't trust them. Pete Carroll has made a, has made chicken salad out of chicken shit for a long time. Now, the chickens have come home to roost. And Russell Wilson can only do so much. Lack of a running game is really going to hurt Seattle. And I think they take the biggest step back. And of course, bringing up the rear of the Arizona Cardinals. The 3-13 and record last year got them Kyler Murray. But Murray's going to be running for his life behind a porous offensive line. That defense gives up way too many points, and their offense lacks punch. I feel sorry for Larry Fitzgerald, who could have come home to Minneapolis, but instead chose to stay out in the desert. But then again, I've been in both Minneapolis and Arizona in October. I would take Arizona in October any day of the week and twice on Sundays. So there you have it. The AFC and NFC previews are done. Next Wednesday, we'll go into who will I think will make the playoffs and be playing in Miami 
in the 53rd edition of the Bowl of Supers. We will take our final time out, come back with Fat Dab Head Slap and a final word from the wood on if kneeling has really served its purpose and run its course. Sports from the Hood with heads down the home stretch after this. You're tuned into Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's foremost location for the most honest insight and opinion on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's the man of the hour after hours, your host, KJ Green. Third and headed from the Hoodwood, KJ Green, and as when we wrap up, wind down the day, wrap up and wind down the show with Fat Dap, Fat Slap, and the final word from the wood. Let's take a look at the Fat Dab. Fat Dab, I will give this week to Monet Davis. Now, that's a name you probably may have remembered from the 2014 Little League World Series. Well, she had come back to Williamsport to give advice uh, on ESPN to uh, Maddie Freaking, who from Coon Rapids, Minnesota, who is the 19th female to play in the Little League World Series and the first since Monet Davis pitched a two-hit shutout and became a media darling in the first female to earn a win at the Little League World Series. Now, Davis will be starting her freshman year at Hampton University here in a couple of weeks on a softball scholarship. Good for her. And she advised Freaking, who will be starting seventh grade, to and start on the Coon Rapids, Minnesota team to enjoy the moment as it is and to stay a kid. Now, those are some sage words from somebody who has been in the very limelight that Freaking is now in currently. Good to see both young ladies so grounded and down to earth. Our head slap of the week goes to someone whom I really think is going to have a promising future in Major League Baseball, but got himself a stern lesson. Ronald Acuna Jr. of the Atlanta Braves failed to run out a what ended up being a long single, thinking it was going to be a tape measure home run, and standing in the batter's box watching it a little too long for... Acuna stayed in the batter's box a little too long for Braves manager Brian Snicker, who is definitely cut from the old school. And he benched Acuna, pulled him right from the game and benched him, telling him basically, run out every hit. You may be able to pose if you know it's gone, but if you have any doubt, you better be hustling. I say bravo to Snicker for setting a solid example of what is going to be tolerated and a head slap to Ronald Acuna who otherwise is having a fine rookie season and I think is uh, a front runner for rookie of the year but kind of made a little bit of an embarrassment of himself with his lack of hustle and now without further ado let's go straight to the final word from the wood kneeling It is something that someone does more often than not as a sign of respect. If anyone gets hurt on the field, especially on a football field, you'll see players take a knee. Anyone who, any man who's asking a woman to be his wife will go to one knee. Me personally, I've never done that and I don't think I ever plan on doing that. But that's neither here nor there. Kneeling more often than not is a sign of deference and respect. But for some, it just seems like kneeling for the national anthem is the ultimate sign of disrespect. Now, on these airwaves, I have gone in length about Colin Kaepernick and how I feel that he has been wronged by the NFL and society in general for his courageous stand for kneel as it is. But Jay-Z as I noted earlier in today's show, stated that we have gotten beyond kneeling and that now that the dialogue has been open, we now know what is wrong. Do we? 
Are there people who know what's actually going on? Do people know why these players knelt? Do they understand that it was never about disrespecting the military? You do realize that Colin Kaepernick was advised to kneel by a former Green Beret. It was never about disrespecting the flag or the anthem. It was about speaking up. It was about saying about speaking to what injustices were going on and are going on and continue to go on. Colin Kaepernick's politics were torn apart, laid bare for the conservative media to rip apart. But is kneeling really a protest that has run its course? When someone kneels on the sideline now, it's more of a sign of, some people think is a sign of disrespect. But many people say to keep Kaepernick's original message alive, kneeling needs to continue. Personally, I think that kneeling, while useful, while it made a point, has run its course. I think that while kneeling or any other points of protest should be respected as part of free speech. But I also think that kneeling has run its course, that it is bringing more negative attention to the kneeler and has completely obfuscated the actual message about police brutality, about the inequality that still plagues this great country in which we all live. It is something that needs to be discussed. And it was a painful reminder that we are still, as a people, very far away and far apart in the needed dialogue that we need to have to better ourselves as a society, as a people, and as a country. Those needed steps of dialogue are still something that's very far away and something that still needs to happen. Colin Kaepernick more or less sacrificed his career for his beliefs, for things that he need, thought needed to be said. These words do indeed need to be said. They need to be spoken at length and by divergent peoples of this country. Will it happen? It's anybody's guess. It is something that needs to happen and happen soon. But on the subject of kneeling, it has run its course. People paid attention to it. Your guess is as good as mine. And that is the final word from the wood. With the music coming up in the background, you know what that means. That means your time in the hood wood is just about done for this week. And I thank you for your visit. The email for the show is kjgreen at blackbanditproductions.com. You can send me emails on show topics, questions, comments, and yes, criticism. I welcome your correspondence and I try to respond to every email in a timely manner. You can catch this podcast on a number of sites, including iTunes and Google Play. The show site itself is hoodwoodsports.podbean.com, which has the back catalog of previous shows. I'm also on Facebook at Black Bandit Productions and Enterprises, and on Twitter as well at KJGreen20 and KJGreenDB. The show can also be found on YouTube. So, that's that, fellow sports fans. Until next time out in the Hoodwood, I'm KJ Green, 30. Sports from the Hoodwood.